السلام علیکم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم In the name of Allah Most gracious, most merciful My beloved brothers and sisters and friends Muslims and Christians We welcome you tonight to this very historic debate entitled Crucifixion, Facts or Fiction. The debate, the uh, format of tonight's debate, the first speaker will speak for 50 minutes. The second speaker will speak for 60 minutes and the first speaker will come again and speak for 10 minutes. After that, you, the audience, will have an opportunity to participate and ask your questions. So with that, brothers and sisters, I'm going to uh, flip the coin and ask the gentleman to choose head or tails, and the one who wins will have the choice to begin or not to begin. أحمد إيدا. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. وقل جاء الحق وذهق الباطل. إن الباطل كان زهوكا. وننزل من القرآن ما هو شفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين. ولا يزيد الظالمين إلا حصارا. صدق الله. صدق الله من رزيم. Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters. At the outset, since I'm beginning the talk, and I see a lot of faces which appear to me to be those of the Christian faith, I would like to put forth a position vis-a-vis -vis Christianity. That Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. We are made to believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth, which many modern day Christians do not believe today. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. And we believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission, and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. As such, the Muslim and the Christian is going together. But the parting of the way takes place on three bases. Number one, the original sin. Number two, the divinity of Christ. And number three, the crucifixion. These are points of differences between the Muslims and the Christians. With regards to the subject of crucifixion, as you see here on this uh, banner here, it says crucifixion, fact or fiction. Now, the Holy Quran gives a, a direct answer to that question. It says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Wa qawlihim inna katan lal masiha, Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah. He said, and they said in boast that we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. The Quran goes on, They they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. But it was made to appear to them so. 
wa inna allazina ikhtalafu fihi la fi shaqqin minhum and those who dispute therein are full of doubts ma lahum bihi min ilm they have no certain knowledge illa tiba zan they only follow conjecture guesswork fiction wa ma qataluhu yaqinan for a surety they killed him not it calls this event described by the christian as crucifixion c r u c i f i x i n crucifixion to fix a person on the cross anyhow by nails or ropes or strings and have him killed to crucify means to kill by hanging or impaling on the cross f i x i o n crucifixion we say it is cruci f i c t i o n fiction it sounds the same crucifixion or crucifixion the spelling gives us the difference between the two that in the islamic point of view it is a fiction now when we say that it is a fiction the christian brings forth produces his book of evidence he says here we have a written record by eye witnesses and ear witnesses to the happenings some 2000 years ago that jesus christ was hanged and killed on the cross some 2000 years ago now what i am going to do tonight is instead of telling you this is what the muslims say this is what the quran says i said look i want to show to you that the bible that you hold in your hands whatever version you have you will find the verses that i'm going to quote and the argument i'm going to adduce see jesus christ after his alleged crucifixion alleged crucifixion he returns to that upper room where they had the last supper and he walks in and he he says shalom alaykum in hebrew meaning peace be unto you when he said peace be unto you his disciples were terrified so i'm asking my learned friends i have been doing this for quite some time my learned friends of christianity why were they terrified because when you meet your long lost master your uncle your grandfather your priest your guru the arab and the jew will embrace one another kiss one another in the neck that's how they meet one another show the love and compassion for one another instead of doing that the disciples of jesus were terrified i want to know why why were they terrified so the christian tells me he says you see in luke chapter 24 we are told by luke that they were affrighted because they thought he was a spirit the wordings are they thought he was a spirit a ghost a spook so i'm asking did he look like a spirit did he look like a ghost did he look like a spook the christian says no then i said why should they think the man is a spirit when he didn't look like one so he gets puzzled this is my experience with the most learned men of christianity they got puzzled why would they think the man is a spirit when he doesn't look like a spirit i said the reason is that the disciples of jesus they had heard from hearsay people were talking that the master was hanged on the cross they had heard from hearsay people were talking that he had given up the ghost in other words spirit had come out he had died they had heard from hearsay what people were talking that he is now dead and buried for 3 days a man with such a reputation you expect that man to be stinking in his grave after 3 days because all the knowledge of the disciples was from hearsay because mark chapter 14 verse 50 he says that at the most critical juncture in the life of jesus all his disciples forsook him and fled all his disciples they forsook him and fled which means they were not eye witnesses or ear witnesses to the happenings the knowledge was from hearsay so on hearsay evidence if you know about a man who is dead and buried and when you see such a person seemingly that person naturally you are terrified because you are thinking the man is a spook a ghost so jesus christ wanting to assure them that is not what they are thinking he says and i'm quoting 
He says, behold my hands and my feet. Look, have a look at my hands and my feet. That it is I myself. I'm the same fellow man. What's wrong with you? What are you afraid of me for? He said, handle me and see. Handle me and see. For a spirit has no flesh and bones as you see me have. A spirit means any spirit. This is an axiomatic truth. You don't have to prove this to the Jews, to the atheists, to the agnostics. It's an axiomatic truth, universally accepted, that a spirit will not have flesh and bones. Then why is Jesus at pains to tell them so? And, and, and in fact, well known and accepted. The reason is because the disciples of Jesus were thinking the man has come back from the dead. He was resurrected. He was spiritualized. That is the reason. So he's telling them, I'm not what you are thinking. I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spook. And they handled him. And they believed not for joy. It means they were overjoyed and wondered, what happened, man? We thought the man was dead and buried. But we can see he's demonstrating that he's himself, flesh and blood. And they believed not for joy and wondered. So Jesus wants to assure them further. He says, have you here any meat? Something to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and a honeycomb. And he took it and he ate in the very sight to prove what? That is a ghost. That is a spook. That is a spirit. No. To prove that he is himself and he is not resurrected. Because the resurrected bodies get spiritualized. Who says so? I say Paul. Who says so? I say Jesus. Who says so? I say each and every one of you. Each and every one of you will admit that the resurrected bodies won't be this. Flesh and blood, flesh and bones. It will be spiritualized. But the greatest testifier of the scriptures, Paul, of Christianity, Paul, in his book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, talking about the resurrection of Christ, the whole chapter in some Bibles is headed the resurrection of Christ. The chapter itself is addressed as resurrection of Christ. In verse 3 he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Verse 4, and he was raised again from the dead according to the scriptures. The scriptures that he's talking about is not Matthew, Mark, Luke and John because they were not written. His is about 56 before, uh, after Christ and the others goes to about 60 according to Christian scholars. So he's not referring to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was, you know, going through them and found out what was what. No, he's speaking from his knowledge of the Old Testament. Verse 14, he says, If Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain, your faith is vain. In other words, Christianity has nothing to offer mankind. You have nothing to offer. And I can assure you that, that in my country, the Christian missionary, when he comes to our homes, he does not come to tell us about hygiene, personal hygiene, I mean. We Muslims are the most hygienic people on earth. I will not go into details, this is not the occasion. The most hygienic people on earth. At question time, you may ask and I will demonstrate to you, I'll ex explain to you. We are the most hospitable people on earth. In ethics and in morality, you can't point a finger at us that we are better than you. No, no group of religious group in my country can show a candle to us that we are better than you. The only thing he can tell us is that you have no salvation. Because salvation only comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus, which you do not accept. That's the only thing he has to tell us. So, Paul says that if this is, didn't happen, then your preaching is vain, useless, worthless, and your faith is also useless, worthless. As the American would put it, it's all garbage. Your religion is garbage if you didn't have this. This is the only sales point that you have. Then in verse 35, he says, 
someone may rationally ask, how do the dead rise again? And with what kind of body will they come? He poses this question not seeking information from us, but it's a rhetoric question and he himself answers it in verse 42. He says there that that which is sown, means buried, is this sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in corruption and it is raised in glory. It is sown, means buried, a physical body and it is raised a spiritual body. Once you die, this body, this physical body is put into the dust, dust with dust, from dust thou out, and to dust thou shalt return, finished. But when you are resurrected, it is not the dust, it will be a spiritualized body according to Saint Paul. And on that premise, the whole of his 14 books in the New Testament are written. More than half the New Testament was written by Paul, 14 out of the 27 books, and the whole premises of his argument is that Christ was risen from the dead, resurrected spiritually. A spiritual body. When people say spiritual body, they think, well, body, what is body? Look at the dictionary. And then you say, look, body has, has, has uh, mass, volume, dimensions. So he says, you see, there was a body. I said, this is an apparition. When you see an apparition, what is the apparition? It appears to us in the form of a body. The ghost you see, the ghost, what do you see? You see something that appears to be a human kind. But we know that thing is something you can't grapple with, you can't grasp it, you can't pocket it. You see, the filmmakers, you American filmmakers in Hollywood, they have made these things something that we can imagine far more easily. Again and again, they conjure up, you know, somebody coming out through a keyhole, a steam comes out, and then you find it materialized into a man, the invisible man, or Sabu. You know, he played the thief of Baghdad, in which you see that he picks up a bottle on the seashore and he opens a bottle and something comes out like a smoke and it materializes into a genie. But that genie has a form, it has a body, but it is an invisible, imperceptible body, something that you can't grapple with. But you say a body, you see a body. If it's only thin air, you see nothing. It might be there, but you see nothing. So it materializes, so we say it appears to us in the form of a body. So spiritual body, says Saint Paul. That's his understanding of the resurrection. Everybody, anybody, when you are resurrected, you'll be spiritualized. And he was only confirming what Jesus had said in the Gospel of Saint Luke, according to the records, chapter 20. Have some water, please. In chapter 20 of Luke, we read there that the Jews, his own people, they come to him. They were always coming to him with poses and riddles, trying to trip this man of God. And now they come to him and they say, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, respected, learned man, priest, bishop, whatever, Rabbi, there was a woman among us. And that woman, according to a Jewish practice, had seven husbands. See, there was a Jewish custom that if one brother died, and he, if he left no offsprings, then the second brother takes her to wife. And when he fails and dies, the third fellow takes her to wife. And when he fails and dies, the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh. Seven guys had this one woman, one after another. But there was no problem because it was all one by one. So they're asking Jesus now that at the resurrection, which guy is going to have her? Because they all had her here. So if you have her here, you want to have her on the other side. This is natural. Suppose you and your wife are resurrected and you see on the other side me, it's a darling, sweetheart, come, sweetie. This is, this is natural. If you recognize your wife, you know, on the other side, this is, well, you know, the closeness that you have established on this earth, for five years, 50 years, you have been together as husband and wife. Now you want to establish or continue the same relationship on the other side. But at the resurrection, since everybody is resurrected instantaneously, you know, simultaneously, same time, then the seven brothers waking up one time and they see this woman, 
then everybody will be going after her. You see? He says, this is mine, I had her. The other guy says, this is mine, I had her. Everybody had her. And everybody will be fighting over this one woman as wife. And there'll be war in heaven between the seven brothers. This is mine, this is mine. Now, where you come from? He says, I had her. Because they won't remember the other guys having her before them. You see? So they want to know from Jesus which guy is going to have her on the other side. Because they all had her here. In answer to that, Jesus says, He says, Neither shall they die anymore. Meaning that once they are resurrected, they will be immortalized. Neither shall they die anymore. They will be immortalized. In other words, the things that kill a person, lack of food, shelter, clothing, rest, these things will not be necessary on the other side. Once you die, you do not die a second time. No more death, immortalized. This is a physical body which has got its physical needs. Food, shelter, clothing, sex, rest. That body, no food, no shelter, no clothing, no sex, no rest of the type that we know. It will be of some kind, other kind, spiritual kind, but not this kind. So he says, neither shall they die anymore. For they are equal unto the angels. In other words, they will be angelized. They'll have spiritual bodies like angels. What kind of bodies they have? Not this. For they are equal unto the angels. They'll be angelized. They will be spiritualized. They will have, have spiritual bodies. They will be spirits. For they are equal unto the angels and the children of God. For such are the children of the resurrection. Such. Spirits. They will be such. Spirits. Paul says spirits. Jesus says spirits. I wonder if there is a single person here who takes exception to that. He says it will be this body. Is there one here in the Royal Albert Hall in front of some 6,000 people in London, I posed the question and there was not a single Muslim or Christian who could t take exception to these axiomatic truths that resurrection, in that, at that time, your bodies will be spiritualized. Paul says so, Jesus says so, I say so, and you say so. So he says the spirit has no flesh and bones. In other words, I'm not what you are thinking. You are thinking that I've come back from the dead. That is not so. I'm not resurrected. And yet the whole Christian world, they said that he died and he was resurrected. The man says, I am not what you are thinking and eating broil fish and honeycomb. These are the needs of this physical body. But somehow, you see, people get programmed. I was talking about people getting brainwashed. At the Berkeley University in 1977, I was talking to the my American people, some teachers and students, and I said, you people are brainwashed. So one professor stood up, he says, I beg your pardon, we are programmed. I said, right, programmed. <laughs> Not brainwashed. So we all get programmed. See, from childhood, because our salvation depends on this, that we must believe that Christ died and was resurrected. But resurrection is spiritual, spiritual. And we find that everything about Jesus, after his post crucifixion events, not once does he appear to be a spirit. He is ever in hiding. He is ever in hiding. He never came out into the open. He never went to the temple of Jerusalem. He had given the Jews a sign. He never went to fulfill that sign. Sign means a miracle. To say, look, you remember what I told you? Here I am. Do, what you, do your worst. But he didn't dare do anything. He didn't dare to go to meet these people, the Jews, his own people. He had given them a sign. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, 39, 40, we read there, again, the same type, type of uh, confrontation. The Jews come along, and they said, Master, again, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, we would have a sign of thee. In other words, we want you to show us a miracle, to convince us that you are above the ordinary. You are the man we are waiting for, the Messiah. Do something like flying in the air, like a bird, walk on the water, give life to the dead, do something, man. Then we know that you are above the ordinary. 
so that we can believe that you are our Messiah. In response to that, Jesus says to his people, he said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. It's a horrible nation, horrible people. You're looking for miracles, tricks. Tricks to convince you that I'm a genuine man of God. You want me to show you some tricks? Magic? He said, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. But there shall no sign be given unto it. No sign, no miracle. Except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Only one. None but one. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man, referring to himself, be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. This is the only sign I'm prepared to give you. The only miracle I'm prepared to concede to is this. He didn't say, you know, blind Bartimaeus, I healed him. You know that woman with issues, bleeding profusely for years. She touched me and she got healed. You know, I brought up Lazarus back from the dead. You know, that girl, she had died and I brought her back. You know, that fig tree, I destroyed it from its very roots. You know, I killed those 2,000 pigs. You know, I turned water into wine. Nothing. Nothing of the kind. He never showed any of these things. Says, look, look back, look back, man, what I have done so far. Said, mm. The only sign I'm prepared to give you is the sign of Jonah. What happened to Jonah is going to happen to me. His miracle is my miracle. And I have been asking these missionaries of Christendom, these hot gospelers, these Bible thumpers, evangelist preachers, I said, now, what was that sign? He said, the, my sign is the sign of Jonah. I said, what was that sign? And believe me, in 40 years, no Christian worth the name has ever come forth to tell me what was that sign. I said, did he fulfill it? He said, yes. I said, what? How? Speechless. Of course, our doctor, Robert Douglas, may be better prepared. He might know all these things beforehand. He's a missionary, you know, in the Middle East, among the Muslims has been, and he's somebody big in the Zwemer Institute. He might have the answer, but I will give it to you. In case he fails, so I might as well give it you beforehand. What was the sign? I said, look, to get the sign, to know what was the sign of Jonah, you have to go to the book of Jonah in the Bible. And that book of Jonah is one page. This is the page. Four short chapters, one page. So if you go to the book of Jonah, it won't take you two minutes. It won't take you two minutes to read this book. This whole book, it won't take you two minutes. So we read there that Jonah was sent to the Ninevites. God Almighty commands him, go to Nineveh and warn the people that they must repent and in sackcloth and in ashes, humble themselves before the Lord, otherwise I will destroy the people. Jonah, a prophet of God, but he is human, he feels despondent, he said these materialistic people, they will not hearken to the message, they will make a mockery out of me. As Jesus described them, a wicked and adulterous generation, this wicked and adulterous generation of Jonah's time, they're going to make a mockery of him. So he says, instead of going to Nineveh to warn the people, he goes to Joppa and takes a boat and is running away to Tarshish. You don't have to remember the names. He, instead of going to one direction, he goes in the opposite direction and is running away. At sea, there is a storm. And according to the superstitions of these people, whosoever runs away from his master's command, deserts his duty, calls for such punishment. So they began to question, who can be responsible for this havoc? Because the storm is not abiding, is not subsiding. So Jonah, he realizes that he's the guilty person. Because actually he's running away from his master's command. God tells him to go to Nineveh, and he's going to Joppa. As a soldier of God, he had no right to do things presumptuously. So he makes a manly comeback. He said, I'm the guilty man, and it is expedient that you take me and you throw me into the sea, and God will be satisfied because actually it's after my blood, not you. And because of me, you innocent people will die. It's better for you that you throw me into the sea. One man perish, save the nation. 
They said, no, you are such a nice man, holy man, maybe praying continuously. He said, we have a system of our own, our own system to find out right from wrong. And that system is a system what is called casting of lots, like head or tail. We do head or tail. We did it just now. Head or tail. So they had a system of casting lots, like head or tail. And according to that system of tossing the coin, it came to the turn of Jonah that Jonah was the guilty man. So they took him and they threw him overboard. And the storm subsided. Perhaps it was a coincidence, but the storm subsided. Now, I'm asking the question that when they threw Jonah overboard, was he dead or was he alive? But before you answer, I don't want to get the wrong answer. Because once you give the wrong answer, you want to stick by it. This is human nature. You know, once you make a wrong statement, you don't like to admit your mistake. So I want to help you before you open your mouth. You don't mind. I said, you see, Jonah had volunteered. He had volunteered. He says, throw me overboard. And when a man over, when he, uh, you know, volunteers, you don't have to strangle him before throwing. You agree? He's, he's volu he says, throw me. You don't have to kill him. You don't have to break his arm or limb. You don't have to spear him. Am I right? The man says, throw me. So when they threw him overboard, was he dead or was he alive? I want to hear from you all. And please, I want to hear that it can also be recorded on our tapes. Please. Was he dead or was he alive when they threw him overboard? What? Alive. alive. You got the right answer, but you got no price for that. <laughs> it was too simple. As you see, it's very simple. The Jews say he was alive. The Christians say he was alive. The Muslims say he was alive. No price. The storm subsides and a fish comes and gobbles him up. Dead or alive? alive. Right. From the fish's belly, he prays to God for help, according to the book of Jonah. I'm asking, do dead men pray? Dead people, do they pray? No. So he, so he was? Alive. alive. A little louder, please. Alive. 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 Marshal. No. Three, you will be given the opportunity at question time, whoever you are, you will be given the opportunity at question time to ask questions. Be man enough, be Christian enough to please keep your mouth shut for the moment. Three, day, three days and three nights, the fish takes him round the ocean. Dead or alive? Alive. alive. Don't be afraid. Don't get terrified. <laughs> <laughs> on the third day, the fish vomits him on the seashore. Dead or alive? Alive. alive. Look. Whether you are a Hindu, or a Christian, or a Jew, or a Muslim, if you read this record, and if you had sound common sense, you will say, alive, 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 alive. And it's a miracle. It's a miracle of miracles. When you throw a man into a raging sea, he ought to die. If he died, no miracle, because we expect him to die. A fish comes and gobbles a man, he ought to die. If he died, no miracle. If he didn't die, it's a miracle. Heat and suffocation in the belly of the whale, the man ought to die. Three days and three nights, he ought to die. If he died, no miracle. No more jizah, no sign. If he didn't die, it's a miracle. So it's a miracle of a miracle of a miracle. An outstanding miracle in the Bible, three times over. It's a miracle from every point of view. So Jesus says, for as Jonah was, Three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. As Jonah was, so shall the Son of Man be. I'm asking, how was Jonah for three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, dead or alive? alive. I'm asking again, how was Jesus in the tomb for three days and three nights? Dead or alive? alive. I beg your pardon? No, according to Christendom. Dead. Ask the professor, ask the doctor. He said he was dead for three days and three nights. Jonah was alive for three days and three nights. Jesus was dead for three days and three nights. Any Christian worth the name will tell you that. Any Christian. You don't have to be a DD and you don't have to be a the theologian or a preacher or an evangelist hearing voices from heaven. You need nothing. 
Jonah is alive. The Christian says Jesus was dead. I am asking in your language, you English-speaking peoples, you Americans who speak English, the Englishman who speaks English, I speak English. I speak English as my mother tongue. See, this is the nearest. Because psychologists say that your mother tongue is the language in which you dream and the language in which you swear. And I dream in English and I swear in English. <laughs> so from that angle, I'm also an Englishman. See, I'm an English-speaking person, though my mother tongue is Gujarati, I speak Urdu, I speak half a dozen different languages, but my mother tongue is English according to the psychologists. <laughs> so I'm asking in your language, those, I'm sure all of you understand English, otherwise you wouldn't be here. I said, in your language, you see, is this like Jonah or unlike Jonah? Jesus says, for as Jonah was, like Jonah. Jonah is alive, Jesus is dead. Is that in your language like Jonah or unlike Jonah? In your language? Unlike. unlike. So I'm asking now, is Jesus speaking the truth or you speaking the truth? Is Jesus a liar or you are a liar? <laughs> Either. Look, you both can be right. He says I'll be like Jonah and you telling me he's not like Jonah. So he failed or he lied or you are lying. You have to admit that you, are, you have misunderstood the whole thing. You're reading this in your own language, simple basic English. King's English or Queen's English. This language I'm talking. For as Jonah was, so shall the son of man be. Like Jonah, not unlike Jonah. The very learned person, he says, no, 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 Mr. Didak. You see, Jesus is here emphasizing the time factor. I said there is nothing mir miraculous about a time factor. Whether man is, you know, dead, I mean, unconscious, or gone into hibernations for three minutes, three days, three hours, three years, that is not a miracle. The miracle is that you expect a man to die and he doesn't die. That's a miracle. But drowning man clutches at straws. You see, he says, no, 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 Mr. D, Dad. You see, it is the time factor that Jesus was emphasizing. Can't you see? He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. He repeats the word three, four times. So it's a time factor that he was emphasizing, not whether dead or alive. So I'm asking, look, did he fulfill that? The time factor. Did he fulfill that? He said, yes. I said, look, you're going to make another slip just now. You're going to fall again. You have made one faux pas. You have made one mistake. You have accused Jesus of lying. He said, I'll be like Jonah. You say he was unlike Jonah. He didn't fulfill it. And you're going to make a second mistake just now. But no, no, no. Drowning men clutches at straws. And you'll find drowning women will do the same. Same. So I said, now, look, when was he crucified? When was Jesus crucified? And Christendom as a whole, they give you the answer, Good Friday. Have you heard of Good Friday? Do you have Good Friday in your country here? We have it in South Africa. They call it in African, Hui Freida. See, Good Friday. In South Africa, we celebrate Good Friday. Swaziland, Basuto, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, name them, name them. Every Christian nation on earth commemorates Good Friday. What makes Good Friday good? They say Christ died for our sins. Is that what makes it good? I said, yes. So it was on a Good Friday. I said, yes. I said, okay. When was he crucified, morning or afternoon? When? Well, some say morning, some say afternoon. I say, I won't argue. Whatever you say, I accept. How long was he on the cross? Some say three hours, some say six hours. I say, I won't argue with you. I won't argue with you. You say three, I accept. If you say six, I accept. I said, you know, the Jews were in a hurry to put him up on the cross. That's the reading of the scriptures. Why were they in a hurry? because they were afraid of the common people. Jesus was a hero to the common people. He had healed the blind, the lepers. He had given life back to the dead. On one occasion, he fed 5,000 people with a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread. On another occasion, another 3,000 people with a few pieces of fish and a few pieces of bread. A man with such a reputation, the people loved the man. And if his life was endangered, there might be a revolt, a riot. So quickly, 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 
apprehend the man and get rid of him. So they grabbed him and they take him, had a midnight trial, which doesn't happen in Jewry. Midnight trial, early in the morning they could take him to Pilate. And as if Pilate had nothing else to do, he was waiting. He receives them and Pilate says, look, this is not my kettle of fish. Take him to Herod. They take him to Herod. Herod had nothing to do. He was also waiting. Nothing to do, these royal people. Nothing to do. They're just waiting. And he said, look, he says, take him back to Pilate. They take him back to Pilate. Pilate is still waiting. All these things happen at the double. Only these things happen in films. In your Hollywood. It, in real life, it doesn't happen. But whatever you tell me, I said, I accept. No arguments. So finally, they get him on the cross. We are told about three o'clock in the afternoon. And he's there for about three hours, according to the Christians. As much as the Jews were in a hurry to put him up, queer people, they were also in a hurry to bring him down. You know why? Amazing. They were in a hurry to put him up, now they're in a hurry to bring him down from the cross. You know why? Because of the Sabbath, Yom Sabbath. Because they were told in the book of Deuteronomy that they must see to it that nobody is hanging on the tree on the Sabbath day, that thy land be not defiled with the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So for that, you know, it was a filthy, dirty, sacrilegious thing for anybody to be hanging on the cross on the Yom Sabbath, Sabbath day. And Sabbath begins at 6 o'clock on Friday. According to the Muslims, the Jews, our day begins at sunset. Day changes. The Jews at sunset, the Muslims at sunset. We, at sunset, we see the moon, we start fasting. At the end of the month, we see the moon, we stop fasting. That's how the Jews count their days and the Muslims count their days. So Sabbath starts on Friday, 6 o'clock. So before that, they want to bring the body down. So hurry, 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 and they manage to bring the body down without breaking the legs. There's a, also a f prophecy being fulfilled in that. They brought him down. And they gave him a burial wash, which takes about an hour, hour and a half. The Jewish, Jewish burial bath, ghusl. Then they put 100 pounds of medicants around him. And they put shroud around him, and they put him into the sepulcher. By now, it's already evening. There's no other way. If this is what you are telling me, your story is correct, then by the time they put him into the grave and did these things, it's already evening. So, Friday night, he's supposed to be in the grave. Watch my fingers. Friday night, he's supposed to be in the grave. Saturday day, he's still supposed to be in the grave. You see, I'm dividing the day into day and night, because Jesus did the same. He said, for as Jonah was three days and three nights, the day into day and night, day and night, day and night, for as Jonah was, so I says, Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night, Sunday morning, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. That's what the Bible says. And the tomb was empty. I said, supposed, supposed, supposed. You know why? Because he could have come out Friday night. But because the Bible doesn't say that, I don't say that. But he could have come out Friday night. So I'm asking, how many days and how many nights? Can you see my fingers, you people? How many? Three. What three? One two nights and a day. You see, two nights and a day. I'm asking, is it the same as what Jesus said? For as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights. I'm asking, look at this. Is it the same? Is it the same? Unless you are blind. Look at this. So he failed again. There is no mathematician on earth, even your Einstein. He can't help you here. Yes, you have to follow Herbert Armstrong. You have to listen to Herbert Armstrong. Is this how you Americans behave in a religious meeting? I said, you have to go and follow Herbert Armstrong. He's dead now, but his hierarchy continues the plain truth, the, the magazine. They're publishing 8 million and 80,000 a month, free distribution. Go and get it. And they will tell you that Jesus Christ was not crucified on a Good Friday. They say it was a Good Wednesday. Do you know that? It's a new trend. And 8 million a month they're pushing out, 8 million. It's going to brainwash the whole of Christendom. 
Sooner or later you'll find everybody is talking about a good Wednesday, a good Wednesday, a good Wednesday. And I'm telling my people in South Africa, I said, look, if our government, if they ever change Good Friday to Good, good Wednesday, we are going to protest. We will march on Parliament House. You know why? Because Good Friday is a good day for the Muslims too. You know why? Because our people who are workers, factories all over, we are able to go to the mosque on Fridays, gather together. And we have the biggest gatherings on Good Friday in our masjids. And we have three days holiday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Once it's Good Wednesday, you'll have only one day holiday. <laughs> so I said, we will march onto Parliament House. And I said, you, my brothers and sisters, are you prepared? Will you be prepared to follow me? And 100% says, we'll follow you. March onto Parliament House. We'll never allow Good Wednesday to come about because it won't suit us. But the Christians, you are in a country. The mighty messenger of God, according to you, he fails a second time in fulfilling one prophecy. I said, look, this man. You say he came to die for the sins of the world. Look at it, at that eventful, that on the verge of that Good Friday, on the Thursday. He takes his disciples to that upper room, and they're having the supper. And at the supper table, he's telling them, he says, you remember, when I sent you out on your mission of preaching and healing, I told you that you we must carry nothing with you, no papers, no shoes, no staff, no stick. Did you lack anything? This is no, we lack nothing. He says, but now I tell you, those of you who have no swords must sell your garments and buy them. Swords, swords, you know, to chop off people's heads. Swords. He's telling them to buy swords. So one of them said, Master, we have two already. So he says, this is enough. Why should two swords be enough? What do you want to do with swords? Paring apples? Bananas? What do you do with swords? Chop off people's heads. And he's telling you in the Gospel of St. Luke, Chapter 19, verse 27. He said, for those my enemies who would not that I should reign over them, I would become the ruler, the king. He says, bring them hither and slay them before me. With what? With your fingers? What do you slay them with? Bring them hither and slay them before me. Cut their throats. If those of you who are not prepared to accept me as your king, bring them and kill them. So now he's telling them, arm themselves, and they arm themselves to the limit. And he takes them to the garden of Gethsemane. I said, what for? To pray? I said, couldn't he have prayed in that upper room? Couldn't he have gone to the temple of Jerusalem, a stone's throw from where he was? <coughs> couldn't he have done that? Why? Get so many. I said, look, there is a strategy involved. When he takes his disciples to get so many. In the middle of the night, not for prayer, he puts eight men at the gate. He says, Terry, here and watch with me. And he takes with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, those fighting Irishmen of the time. Peter, the rock, and the sons of Zebedee, they were sons of thunder. This is the title given to them, fight among the Jews. He takes them into a, further into the garden, and he makes an inner line of defense. And he says, sit ye here and watch with me. Watch what? Means keep guard. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. He said, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, meaning that remove the difficulty from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. I want you, oh my Lord, I want you to save me, but in the end I put myself at your disposal. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as if it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. What a choice. God Almighty has made a choice. There was a contract between father and son before the worlds began, says the Christian. Before the worlds began, there was a contract between father and son. He says, my son, I will send you into the world in the year 4000 after Adam. And I want you to die for the sins of mankind. It looks like Jesus didn't know anything about it. Look how he's behaving. Eight at the gate. Shh, you study here. Shoot, three, come, follow me. Shh. You sit here. Is this how you prepare for suicide? Is this how you prepare for sacrifice? A willing sacrifice? You tell me. If you have ever served in the army at any time, or been with the scouts, scout boys, or scout girl guides, you will be able to confirm that when you do things like that, you are preparing. It's a strategy of preparation. Not for death, but for protection. And swords, if the Jews were to come there, he says, I know my people, you see, the spirit that the disciples were showing, they were beating the breast in that upper room. So, Master, we are prepared to go to prison for you. Master, we are prepared to die for you. Such people with sticks and stones and two swords, they would have knocked hells into the Jews. But the Jews were cleverer than what he thought. 
they bring Roman soldiers with them. The situation changes. Against trained men, what can you do? They'll be cut to pieces, your disciples. So Jesus says, put down your sword, because he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Didn't he know this before? He knew. But circumstances changes, and the man changes. He's a master strategist, but he had not come to die, and he had not died. As such, he was neither killed nor crucified. You see, all his actions, post Crucifixion action, supposed to be crucified. After every action, every move that he makes, the way he behaves is that of a man who has escaped death by the skin of his teeth, not the one who has been resurrected. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed Dida. Uh, Reverend, uh, Pastor, Robert Douglas. Uh, you are fortunate in being able to be a part of a gathering such as this. At the very outset, I, I want to make you aware uh, that there are very few places in the world where this kind of a gathering could take place. Uh, these sorts of discussions, I'm sure, take place in uh, South Africa. I assume Mr. Ahmed Didat does such things quite regularly there. Uh, I know of him by reputation and that he travels the world, uh, that he uh, spoke uh, in interaction of this kind in London some time back with a, an acquaintance of mine, uh, Reverend Anis, Anis Sharosh. And of course, uh, he's here from time to time in the United States. May I try to impress upon all of you the uniqueness of these kinds of gatherings and that in fact they basically take place in uh, those countries that we think of as Western countries. Uh, I would suggest that the next one of these ought to be in Damascus or in Cairo or in Baghdad or in Rabat, uh, but I know that that won't happen. That won't happen precisely because uh, if not the governments, at least uh, some of the peoples of those countries would not permit it. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this gathering and that we have a context of this kind in which we can come together and talk about these matters. I was uh, truly interested in, in what Mr. Didot had to say, and I want to touch very briefly on some of the points that he raised as uh, I go through these few minutes that are allotted to me. But I want to start out by uh, simply saying that he is absolutely right. From the Christian perspective, uh, so much centers on the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I would disagree with him that the only thing that Christians have to offer is salvation through the blood of Jesus. I think that's uh, uh, an overstatement for your benefit. He knows better than that. The Christians have many more things to offer than that that are uh, tremendously unique. But nevertheless, at the very center of what Christianity purports to be is the concept of the reality of the death, the crucifixion and death and burial and physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The Gospels set this forth as a statement. For example, in Matthew 27, verse 50, it simply says that having been on the cross for a while, let me back up. A few verses earlier, it says they crucified him. It then describes a series of events upon the cross, and in verse 50 concludes that he gave up his spirit, whatever that means. In Mark chapter 15, again it states that they crucified Jesus. And in verse 37 it says, he breathed his last. There's no question about what the Christian Gospels are setting forth. Namely, that Jesus was crucified and that he in fact did die on the cross. Now really, the issue that we're dealing with here is a deeper one. I'll touch on the text or two that Mr. Didot shared with you uh, just briefly. But ultimately what we're talking about, though we're not talking about directly, 
is the whole question of the reliability of the Bible. Now, Mr. Didot is affirming tonight in his own indirect sort of way that the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, and the writings of Peter and Paul and James and the others who contributed material to make up the New Testament simply are unreliable, that they are false. False at least to the extent that they affirm that Jesus died and arose from the dead. Now, I find that an interesting kind of assumption that is behind all of this discussion. You see, we can talk about the crucifixion and, and we can talk about a spirit a spiritual body or a spiritualized body and, and uh, three days and all of those things and dead or alive in the belly of the fish, but uh, that's really somehow diverting our attention from what's center. At the very center and core of all of this is can you trust God? That's the issue. And what kind of a God do you believe in? Now, the holy book says, My covenant will I not break, nor alter the things that have gone out of my lips. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall not pass away. Or, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And the Quran on several occasions affirms that none can change the words of God. I would raise the question tonight at the very outset. It seems unrelated, but to me it's centrally related. Would any of you Muslims here tonight dare to entertain the idea of changing the Quran? No. Say it louder. No. You're absolutely right. The thought would not enter your mind. Why? Because you believe it, the Word of God, and you would dare not tamper with it. And even if you decided to perish that thought, you certainly would not be successful because Qurans today are found from Fiji to Malaysia to Indonesia to Bangladesh and India and Pakistan and Iraq and Syria and do I need to continue to name the places Kansas City and Lawrence and Chicago and New York City and Los Angeles and Buenos Aires and Caracas and on and on and on. So imagine that two of you or ten of you or a hundred of you decided to get together and alter what the Quran says. You would be discovered very, very quickly. Because there is no way that you somehow could gather up all of the Qurans in the world. If you did, people would say, what are those people in Lawrence doing with all of the Qurans in the world? But you see, in effect, it is that what you would not entertain the thought of doing Christians did to a book that they love as much as you love the Quran. And that what you could not do because of the impossibility of it, somehow they did. For very early, the Christian message in written form was scattered among multitudes of peoples and languages and countries, many of whom did not like each other and did not trust each other, many of whom had different theological perspectives. And you know what a problem that is. You know what happens in a religion class at Kansas University, if they offer such here, in Islam? when you have Shiite students and Sunni students. I know what happens. You know what happens. They're constantly watching each other in terms of how they might relate to whatever the professor says because they disagree about certain things. Now you may say, well, they all agree about the Quran and the five pillars. That's beside the point. The point is there is a degree 
at some level of suspicion and distrust. And so there was among those early Christian groups, I am ashamed to say. And so there still is today among Christian groups. I would be a fool not to admit that. But the point is, given that kind of a context, given the fact that all Christians who truly know something of God love God's Word, the Holy Book, the Bible, who would dare change it? Who would think to change it? And how would they bring it to pass? And so you see, given the fact that the New Testament affirms the crucifixion and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, Mr. Dot is forced simply to deal with a variety of things that, and he could extend his list on out, he has many more arguments than these that he could offer, but he's forced to deal with a variety of things that are not that weighty. For example, he wants to talk about a spiritualized body and says, who said so? Paul, poor exegesis, Mr. Didat, to equate spiritual with spirit or spiritualized is not to respect the context of the New Testament and the possibility of a variety of meanings for the word. For example, in Galatians 6 and 1, the Apostle Paul says, and let those of you who are spiritual restore such a one. Is he saying, let those of you who have spiritualized bodies? No. But Mr. D. Dot would have you understand that the word spiritual in 1 Corinthians 15 always must mean one and the same thing, namely spirit or spiritized. That's just bad exegesis. That's not respecting the context of the New Testament and the variation in the possibility of the uses of words. He tells us, for example, that when Jesus uh, was betrayed, everyone fled, and so we have no eyewitnesses to his crucifixion. How do you know that? That is an assumption. The New Testament does not say, having fled, they stayed away. You have to assume that, and that is an assumption you make because it is one that somehow supports the position that you want to take. He wants to say about Jesus and Jonah. Was Jonah alive in the belly of the whale? Yes. And so was Jesus alive? He wants to talk about threes and so on. I'll tell you the answer to the sign, Mr. Didot. It is that Jonah was entombed. It happened to be in a fish. And Jesus was entombed. It happened to be in the earth. The issue is not three. The issue is not dead or alive. The issue is entombment. I'm surprised to hear you admit, I think you admitted that Jesus was in the tomb alive for three days. Now, that's not standard Muslim doctrine. Standard Muslim doctrine is that Jesus' similitude or image somehow was imparted to someone standing nearby and Jesus got away scot-free and someone else was on the cross. Well, that is a Muslim interpretation, is it not, my friend? If you would look among your scholars, if you would look at the range of opinions and interpretations in Islamic theology, this is at least one perspective. Now, what's not being said to many of you people tonight, you Americans, is this, that Islam has a great divergency of perspectives on a variety of issues. But you're not going to hear that tonight. You're not going to learn that. What is said to you tonight by one man is in effect reported as that which all Muslims believe about a certain thing. And we could pick a hundred subjects tonight and discover considerable diversity. Jesus was in the tomb three days alive. I'm astonished. 
What does three days equal, he asks. Well, I would suggest to you, what does five minutes equal? In Beirut, you'd better not take five minutes to mean five minutes on the clock, 60 seconds, because it doesn't. Can you repair my shoes? Yes. When, they will, when will they be ready? Five minutes. It means a little while. It's very imprecise. You want to ask me, Dr. Douglas, how much time did you spend in Lawrence, Kansas? Two days. When did you arrive? Two o'clock Thursday. When did you leave? Nine o'clock Friday. That hardly sounds like 48 hours, but it is two days. For that is the way we use language and that is the way the writers of the New Testament use language. And so you see it's to trivialize the thing to come along and in effect begin to clip down days and ask what's really going on here. You have to respect the context, the, the setting, the way people in their own cultures deal with issues and subjects and so on and so forth. All right, having said all of that, let me go on to say what I want to say. Namely, that the holy book points almost from its beginning to the crucifixion, to the death, and to the resurrection of Jesus. I cannot develop these in detail for you, and so I run the risk of appearing foolish in the process but I invite you to look at them nonetheless. In the holy book, Genesis 22, we are told of Abraham offering his son. Muslims believe it was Ishmael. The book of Genesis says it was Isaac. That's another question altogether. But in the course of this, Isaac, the son, as this text says, asks, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham says, God will provide the lamb, my son. Abraham ties his son and prepares to slit his throat. And the Lord intervenes and points him to a ram, to an animal. And the Lord said, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you. This is an allegory, a type, an analogy, a true historical event also. Pointing to the nature of God as a God willing, as it were, to provide the lamb of sacrifice which Jesus is identified as being. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, says John the Baptist when he first encounters Jesus. Similar things turn up at the Passover in the book of Exodus, in the 12th chapter. There the people are called upon to take a lamb for the family. This lamb is to be without defect. It must be slaughtered. And God says, on that night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animal, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be for you a sign on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Again, recall that the affirmation of the New Testament is that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And the writing of the Apostle Paul which says, Christ our Paschal or Passover Lamb is offered. Now either Jesus is the Lamb of God, either Jesus is the Passover Lamb on the type of the Lamb offered in Egypt that prevented the death angel from slaying, or the scriptures that the Christians and the Jews have are unreliable. And if they are unreliable, I submit to you tonight that God has failed. Because God said his word would not pass away. 
God said he would preserve his word. God said no one can change his word. In the Day of Atonement, as described in Leviticus 16, again, an analogy drawn out of the history of the Jews. On that particular day, an animal, in fact, two animals, play different roles. One becomes, in effect, the sacrifice for the sins of the people. The other, while living, comes to carry all of the sins of the people far away into a lonely place where that sin no longer is present. They am to have to confront moment by moment and day by day. In the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, chapters 9 and 10, in a very extensive sort of way, the idea is developed that Jesus is both the priest and the sacrifice, the one who cancels and removes sin. The prophets spoke as well. One quick example from the book of Isaiah. Now I understand that Mr. D. Dot will be tempted to say that's an interesting prophecy. But where does it say that it has anything to do with Jesus? Well, it doesn't in the book of Isaiah. I mean, after, after all, Isaiah lived 700 years before Jesus came along. But as you come to the writings of the New Testament, as people saw more fully the purposes of God unfolding, they saw its meaning and made application. Now, they were either wrong or they're right. And if they're wrong, God failed. Because God said he would preserve his word and protect his word. In 53 of Isaiah, we read he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, by oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. A little later in the same portion we read, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of the many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Well, now, if you think about that and read that carefully, you can see the connection between those statements and what Abraham was doing earlier and what took place at the Passover and what happened in the Day of Atonement. And when you come to the New Testament, the same train of thought continues on. Jesus' death was foreshadowed and foretold. Jesus, during his life, spoke about his death. He did so indirectly, and of course I know we can uh, argue over what these verses mean. But for example, in John 2.19, he said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. John adds, and he said this speaking of his body. Three times in the Gospel of John, Jesus speaks of being lifted up. Now in John's thinking, the idea of being lifted up is not only the idea of being lifted up on the cross, but also then being lifted up into heaven and exalted as Lord. And in one of the passages that speaks of Jesus being lifted up, there is added the comment, and by these words, he showed the manner of his death. It had to do with his death. In John the 10th chapter, Jesus makes this amazing kind of statement. 
And remember again, does God protect his word? Can people change the word of God at will? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Now, he didn't say the good shepherd acts like he lays down his life for his sheep. The good shepherd goes through the motions but doesn't really do it. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep, and I am the good shepherd. Three times in about ten verses, he says, I lay down my life. And he adds, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. You see, he does not lay his life down merely to lay it down. He does not die merely to die. He dies in order to be resurrected bodily. Jesus talks in John 12 of the seed falling into the ground. And as it falls into the ground and dies, it brings forth much fruit. If you put that in its context, again, he is talking about being lifted up. And if we have difficulty with all of these rather ambiguous kinds of figurative statements, then we have a great abundance of other statements like, and he, Jesus, then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now this may well be why they were terrified and thought they saw a spirit. They had no anticipation that Jesus would rise from the dead. They could not entertain the idea, and yet Jesus spoke to them very plainly and clearly about it on a number of occasions. In the next chapter of Mark, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask him about it. That's Mark 9. Mark 10. Again, Jesus is with his disciples, and he says, The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him, spit upon him, flog him, and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now, in case people want to quibble and say, well, Jesus speaks in these verses about the Son of Man. And in case someone of you wants to say, well, now, the expression Son of Man merely means a human being, as in the book of Ezekiel. Let me assure you that the expression Son of Man, like spiritual, has a variety of meanings, not just one or even two. And fairness says that one understand and grapple with the full range of variety of meanings. On one occasion, Jesus says, no one ascends into heaven, but he who descended out of heaven, even the Son of Man. The Son of Man, whoever he is, is not just a human being. The Son of Man is someone who descended from heaven. That's hardly a man having sex with a woman and she conceives and a child is born. There's something divine going on there. And in John chapter 9, beginning in verse 35, to make it very plain, Jesus speaks to a man who was blind, who, to whom he had given sight again, and he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man said to him, Who is he that I may believe in him? And Jesus said, He it is that speaks with you. And who was speaking with him? Jesus. So let's not go chasing rabbits and somehow try to set aside the clear statements that Jesus makes where he says the Son of Man will be killed by somehow saying, well, the Son of Man, we don't know who that is. 
in the Gospels, Jesus uses it as one of the titles for himself. But more than that, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, Jesus says that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now you may want to say, well, you can give your life in diligent service. It doesn't necessarily mean give your life in death. But you go a bit farther and find Jesus as he talks about the beginning of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, the communion, whatever you wish to call it. He takes the cup and he said, this cup is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for many for the remission of sins. Jesus intended to give his life a ransom for many by pouring out his blood. Mr. Dot talks about the garden and the business of buying swords and placing eight men at the gate of the garden to guard it. I submit to you that's an assumption. Where does it say he placed them there to guard it? The text does not say that. Someone is reading into the text an idea which they find somehow helpful, trying to assert that, no, Jesus had no intention of dying. He had an intention of fighting, of continuing on, and of living. And so we're back finally then from the allegories and the figures of the Old Testament, from the figurative language of Jesus to the plain statements of Jesus that I will be delivered up, I will be crucified, I will be killed, I will rise from the dead on the third day to the record of that event taking place in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now either that is true or it's not. I agree. It's either crucifixion or it's F-I-C. T-I-O-N. But, but if it is F-I-C-T-I-O-N, then I would submit to you that somehow God has failed. And Mr. Didat undoubtedly will want to come back and say, well, look at your scriptures. Look at the many different uh, uh, variations. Look at the many different manuscripts. Uh, look at the many different editions, the many different translations. I hope none of you get caught up in that. There are multitudes of translations of the Quran. I could bring the Quran in English by Muhammad Marmaduke Pickthall and the Quran by uh, Yusuf Ali in English and point you to certain passages that say different things. But what does that prove? That proves nothing. That proves that the person who translated the Arabic into the English or the persons who did that disagreed among themselves as to the proper English words to convey the Arabic. And so for someone to come along and say, aha, here is a version, here is a translation, here is the Revised Standard, here is the King James, and look at the differences. Really, if that proves anything about the Bible, it proves the same thing I would submit to you about the Quran. And so the word of the New Testament is that Jesus died, that Jesus arose from the dead, and that he lived. Such is the message of the apostles found all through the New Testament, affirmed by each and every one of them. Rushing very quickly on, such is the information that comes out of historical sources. The cross, as a symbol, dates back in history almost to the time of Jesus, found among the earliest Christian communities of which we had any record. Baptism, a Christian act, an ordinance, a sacrament, Christians call it different things, but all agree that it somehow is associated with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. As ancient as Christianity, the Lord's Supper, the Communion, the Eucharist, whatever one chooses to call it, likewise bearing the symbolism of the Christ who died in his body of flesh, gave his blood, 
and was raised to life again. The testimony of ancients, or you can say, yes, they did not live in the exact days of the disciples. But you find a man like Justin Martyr in his Defense of Christianity, written about A.D. 150, urging the emperor to check the details of the death of Christ recorded in a document called the Acts of the Roman Governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate. You find Tacitus writing in his Roman annals early in the first century, discussing the origins of Christianity and speaking of Christ, who was executed by the sentence of the procurator Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. You find a man named Thallius writing in about 52 AD, quoted by a Christian named Julius Africanus, talking about the crucifixion of Christ. You find in a Syriac manuscript dated from 73 AD in the British Museum, the question raised, what, what did the Jews gain by executing their wise king? You find rabbinic traditions in the Talmud, tractates of the Sanhedrin, saying Jesus was hanged on Passover Eve. What does all of this mean? Well, now one possible explanation is that either these things happened or these people were deceived. Again, looking at some Muslim interpreters of the Quran, they did not kill him, they did not crucify him, it only seemed that they did so. The interpretation of that particular passage often carries the idea that in fact the Romans and the Jews were deceived. That they thought they crucified Jesus, but in fact they did not. They crucified someone else. Well, who deceived them? Were they just ignorant? Just foolish? Or was it something of a movement of God to protect his prophet? If it was God acting to protect his prophet, what kind of a God is that? To foist such a hoax on so much of the world? And were the disciples deceived? And if they were deceived, by whom were they deceived? Sheer ignorance or by God? Who wasn't deceived when it came to this matter of the crucifixion and the death of Jesus? It seems like everybody was. And if everybody was, then once again, what happens to God? who is concerned to reveal his message for humankind in and through a prophet like Jesus, who thus is defeated from the very outset because the Romans and the Jews are deceived and the Christians must have been also. Either they were deceived or they were dishonest. They knew better but they deliberately and willfully and maliciously wrote that he died when he hadn't. Why send the Injil to Jesus only to almost immediately fail? Which must be what happened if the disciples likewise were deceived. Why the crucifixion? Why the resurrection? Well, it's more than salvation through the blood of Christ, but it is that. Mr. Didat at the very outset pointed to a difference between Christianity and Islam in terms of the concepts of sin. Original sin, he referred to, an idea that has a half a dozen different interpretations in Christian circles. Christians are not agreed about the meaning of all of the implications of original sin. 
But Christians are agreed in their understanding that what the Bible is saying, the holy book is saying, is that human beings are sinful and that that sinfulness involves more than simply a mistake. That there is something fundamentally wrong with humankind as the consequence of the choice that people made in rebellion against God that brought a serious consequence with it so that people are bent out of shape. The evidence? I think scripture and human experience. I mean how many of you, if you would be honest, in the depths of your heart, in the quiet of your night when you're alone, can actually, actually, deal with and overcome those tendencies within you toward self-centeredness, toward pride, toward lust, and on and on the list would go. And I think in a moment of honesty most all of us would admit, no. We are not able through our own energies nor through ritual to overcome those things. Why? Because of the doctrine set forth in the holy book regarding the nature of sin. Why the crucifixion? Well, let me put it in this kind of context. The crucifixion in some ways is a question of honor. A question of the honor of God. Now the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament says that if a man sleeps with his mother, uh, if a man sleeps with his mother, he brings dishonor on his father, and he should be put to death. If a man sleeps with his sister, he brings dishonor on his family, and he should be put to death. And on and on the provisions of the code of law go, raising the question of honor. You know about honor. You know about honor. Dishonor cuts one off. And so in the book of 1 Samuel in the Old Testament, we are told that Eli's sons have brought dishonor on their father and they will be... And within one chapter they are dead and gone. We read of Belshazzar, a heathen king in the book of Daniel. And God says to him, because you have dishonored God, your days will be terminated. Your kingdom is over. You see, not only is it possible for us to dishonor our families, but it is possible for us to dishonor God. And so God in several places in the Old Testament says, You have dishonored me. You have brought shame on me. And in the New Testament, Jesus, quoting from the prophet Isaiah, speaking of the Jewish people of his day, says, These people honor me with their lips only but their heart is far from me. You see, it is possible to honor God with one's lips and yet at the same time dishonor God. How does one deal with dishonor when it comes to pass? May I suggest to you it's not through ritual. You who are Muslims, think of your home countries. Think of the views that many people in your societies have. A daughter, a sister, slips out of the house unaccompanied and meets a young man on the street corner. And they talk, or walk, or hold hands, or touch, or have sex. A disgrace. And so the girl comes home having been discovered and she says, Father, brother, family, I'm sorry. And they say, that's all right. 
forget it. You know better than that. You know that you do not remove dishonor brought on the family of a serious nature by someone merely saying, oh, I'm sorry, and someone else saying, forget it. What about the honor of God? When the honor of God has been offended, when you and I have brought shame on the very God who made us, what is to be done? Do you mean that we stand and say, God, I'm sorry? or that we perform some sort of external ritual, or that we even come with our heart and say, with all of my heart, I'm sorry, and I perform this ritual. No. God intervenes at that point, and here is the miracle of miracles. Jesus said in John 15, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. And I now call you my friends. And so God sends Jesus as the one who will step in between, who will deal with the issue of the dishonor that we have brought on God by making amends, by dying for us. As many a man or woman has died because they have dishonored their father or their brother or their sister. And the Quran talks about Abraham redeeming his son through a noble sacrifice. This is what God has done. He has redeemed us from the penalty due because we dishonor him by a noble sacrifice. That sacrifice being Jesus, the one who steps between, the one who becomes the protector the one who is the mediator or the intercessor, the one who takes the blow if there is a blow to be taken. And indeed, in issues of honor, there is always a blow to be taken. And so in John chapter 5, Jesus says, Moreover, the Father judges no one but has entrusted all judgment to the Son that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I submit to you tonight that the crucifixion and the resurrection must be a reality. Otherwise, you and I are left with no hope, for we have offended the honor of God and it is not so lightly set aside. Well, is all of this reasonable? That one would die for others? Reasonable? Yes. Above reason? Also, in some ways, yes. But it nonetheless is the act and the movement of God. A demonstration of God's love a demonstration of God's mercy, a demonstration of God's justice, a forgiveness grounded in the very nature of God, demonstrating the very nature of God. I would submit to you tonight that any sort of hope for eternal life based on each one of us being good enough or performing the ritual well enough is a very, very shaky kind of hope. God has set forth in the Bible, and I think also set forth in Islam, is a God of justice, a God who avenges, and also a God who is merciful and a God who is compassionate. Now I suggest to you that it's very difficult to somehow harmonize those ideas. How can you be just and avenging of your honor and of the insult done to you and at the same time be merciful and compassionate? By simply waving away the offense? 
That may be mercy and compassion, but where is justice? Where is the avenging nature? Do you discount it? Do you ignore it? Do you deny it? Does it cease to be? On the other hand, to bring the judgment, to exercise the justice, to avenge what happens, we all go to hell. And so what do you do? The response of the Injil, who is Jesus, is that in Jesus God set forth both his justice and his mercy and compassion in dealing with our rebellion, the insult we have done to him, the dishonor that we have brought upon his holy name by in effect stepping in between taking our place, becoming our protector, bearing the blow that is ours, taking it upon himself. As Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And that is what Jesus did, laid down his life for his friends, for all people who would look to him and thus would depend upon him in some degree of trust, in his act, not in their goodness. Let me then make these last few comments as my time is going. Five minutes? Five minutes, okay. Let me suggest to you some of the things not being said tonight, and some of you aren't going to like to hear this. Some of you are going to say no, as some of my Christian brothers a moment ago were saying no. But I urge you, I urge you to check your history, to check your scholars, to reach out and delve into the wide-ranging diversity within Islam and come to some answers. Let me suggest some things not being said tonight. Is the Bible reliable? No, it has variations in spelling. Is the Bible reliable? No, there are differences in interpretation. Is the Bible reliable? No, there are differences in translation. Is the Bible reliable? No, because sometimes you find the first verses of John 8 and the last verses of Mark 16, and sometimes you don't. Is the Bible reliable? No, because some of the stories in it sound rather like stories that you might find in pagan sources. Is the Bible reliable? No, because there are a number of scholars. Dr. Didot can pull their quotations from his briefcase from the Encyclopedia Biblica and others that would say the whole business of the crucifixion and the resurrection is a hoax. I would submit to you tonight that he doesn't want to do that because you see those scholars do not believe in God they do not believe in the supernatural and the criticisms that they level against the Bible whether it be the crucifixion the resurrection or whatever else, they would level against the Quran because they do not believe the Quran is from God. So I would hate to quote a man who doesn't believe the Quran to somehow prove that you shouldn't believe the Bible. You can't have it both ways. Ask about the presuppositions of those who are cited and whom you quote. But back to what I was saying. If someone wants to say, well, there are problems with the text of the Bible, because there are variations in spelling. There are variations in spelling in places in the Quran. Does that prove it is not from God? Well, you would say, no, that doesn't prove it's not from God. But then if it doesn't prove that there, why does it prove it over here? Different interpretations. Oh, there are different interpretations of the Quran. Different versions. Well, there are different versions of the Quran, different translations. Missing verses, but the Quran has abrogations in it, does it not? Shaking your head, no. I read Muslim scholars who say there may be 250 verses that have been abrogated. 
So you disagree with your own scholars. Quran has materials from pagan sources? Well, maybe. Quran is not to be subjected to higher criticism? Well, we can understand that. The point simply is that if you are unwilling to entertain the possibility of considering these things with the Quran, you have no right to point to these things as it regards uh, as regards the Bible. Still five minutes. Okay. Good. So, what does all this prove? Well, it simply says this. Reason and logic says that these things don't prove anything one way or the other. I mean, variations in the spelling within the Greek text of the Bible, what does it prove? Nothing more than variations in spellings in the Quran. Differences in translations into English or Indonesian or French, what does it prove? Nothing. Nothing about the Quran, nothing about the Bible, just that translators have a problem. The question of whether all of the verses are there or not. Well, in the Quran, I mean, we have a problem. We have a problem in that whatever variants existed were collected and destroyed. And your traditions record that. If only you will read your traditions. Now, in the Bible, in the bottom of the text of the Greek New Testament, all the variants are set out, and they are many. But how can you determine what is authentic? if you don't have these things to look at. I mean, if there's nothing to check against, and yet the traditions record that there were differences, we're left somehow in a quandary. What I'm arguing for here, I hope you understand, is not an attack on the Quran. It's simply a case of saying, as we say in English, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. If you want to raise these arguments against the Bible, then in integrity, you must be willing to investigate these same arguments with regard to the Quran because the same conditions exist there. From a Christian perspective, from the perspective of the Holy Book, the crucifixion of Jesus is not F-I-C-T-I-O-N, it is F-A-C-T. Jesus was crucified, he was killed, he died, he was buried, and three days later, he was raised from the dead. Either this is true on the basis of what the Holy Book says, or as Dr. D. Dot has said, the whole thing is a fiction. And if it is a fiction, then somehow the God who sent Jesus as the most exalted of prophets and the one nearest him to bear his injeal to the world has failed. Failed for many centuries. Failed for at least 600 years, you may say. Not failed ultimately because maybe there it came back in the Quran and through Muhammad. But there's 600 years of failure. Now I'm not quite sure to what to make of a god who has 600 years of failure on his record. And yet somehow that is a part of the issue that we are having to deal with. I'll stop at that point. Mr. Ahmed Didat for 10 minutes. Mr. Chairman and brethren, you know, Dr. Douglas, has pulled so many red herrings before me, I don't know which one to follow. You see, he has brought up things absolutely irrelevant to the debate. The authenticity of the scriptures, which was not in question tonight, 
I had a debate on that subject with Brother Jimmy Swaggart, one or two hour session, debate and questions and answers. Now he's pulling that red herring before me. Do I pursue that? About the variation of the Quran, shall I pursue that? Or about the different versions as compared to the translation of the Quran, shall I pursue that? In other words, this 10 minutes, you know, all will be wasted if I start pursuing these red herrings that he has thrown, pulling wool over our eyes. You see, he makes statements, you know, contradictory statements. He says that Jesus was alive in the tomb for three days and three nights. He was alive. At the same time, now he said on the third day he was resurrected. He is a unique person in my experience. I have come across hundreds of learned Christians. Nobody ever told me that Jesus was alive. He was dead, they say, on the cross. And for three days and three nights he was dead in the tomb. And on the third day he was resurrected. But his idea is no, that he was alive. So he's, you know, running with the, oh, with, the, with, the, with, the with the hound, you know, hunting with, running with the hare and hunting with the hound. He has been trying to give us, he says, spiritual or spirit has so many meanings. I agree. Spirit in the Bible does not mean the same thing every time. When you talk about the spirit, they say it's the Holy Ghost. That I have the spirit of God, they mean they have the Holy Ghost. Then the Bible speaks about seven spirits of God that went out into the world. No Christian said there were seven Holy Ghosts. See? We are told in the Gospel of St. John that he that is born of spirit is spirit. And he that is born of the flesh is flesh. We know it doesn't mean what Jesus was talking about. These are different things on different levels and they have different meanings. But at the same time, why does not Brother Douglas tell you that the word dead and died also have a dozen different meanings in the Bible? The dead doesn't mean dead in the sense that the man, his soul has departed from the body. You see, sir, in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, God Almighty warns Adam. He says, this fruit of this certain tree thou shalt not eat, for the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And yet Adam lived for 930 years. So, the learned men of Christendom, they have a nice way out. He says, no, this was spiritual death. Spiritually he had died, but physically he lived for 930 years. And I agree with them. Why not the same explanation be given in the case of Jesus? You speak about the prodigal son in your preachings to your congregations. Prodigal son, the one who had asked for his talents from the father and had gone to a foreign land, uh, met bad company in the mire, in the gutter, and there he makes up his mind to return, and he returns. And the father, representing God, he sees this prodigal returning, and he says that this my son was dead and is now alive. He was lost, is now found. Why don't you tell us that, look, this dead doesn't mean dead, it was separation from the father. Explain to them that it's separation, it's not death. Because the child, the son had never died. Adam had never died for 930 years. So it's separation, separation, separation. So death means separation also. Why won't you not now translate or explain that this death of Jesus, was also a separation from God. Because you read in your own scriptures, no use bringing the Quran into the picture. But we are talking about your records. Explain your records as they are in your own language. You see, Jesus on the cross is supposed to have cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What is this forsaken? Adam was forsaken by God. You call it death. The son, prodigal, had de departed from his father, separated from the father. It was death. Jesus Christ, according to his own admission, he's separated from God. He's dead. That is spiritual death. But the death that you're talking about, he must die physically. He must give his life that his soul departs from his, from his body. That is death. And if that death took place, then you say for three days he was alive. And this miracle that Jesus is talking about, the miracle of Jonah, miracle, is not being entombed, entombed as you say, 
for three days and three nights. What's miraculous about that? You put a man in a cave, in a tomb for three days and three nights, what's miraculous about that? If you put him for three weeks, what is miraculous about that? The miracle is that you expect a man to die, and if he doesn't die, it's a miracle. And according to that, the whole of Christendom says that Jesus was dead for three days and three nights, Jonah was alive for three days and three nights, and as such, he didn't fulfill the prophecies. Crucified. This is now, what does the word crucified mean? Crucified means to kill. To kill by hanging or impaling on the cross. If a person is put onto a cross, for example, numerous cases, we have records here from our newspapers, Filipinos. It says 13 Filipinos have themselves crucified imitating, imitating Christ. 13 Filipinos. Dozens of Filipinos, every Easter they get crucified in, in, in the Philippines. Dozens. I'm sure you read these records. But what is actually taking place is that the person is taken to the cross, he's hanged, he's nailed, and he's brought down, and he's alive, and he walks away smoking cigarette. <laughs> now, in your language, sir, there is not a word, there is not a verb in your language to describe that. That the man was put on the cross, what is that, crucified? He says crucified here, but the man is alive, so what happened? Was he crucified? Twenty years later, somebody shoots him and he dies, or he meets a motor car accident and he dies. How would you say was his end? Crucified or hanged or shot or drowned? How? You have no word in your language. The deficiency is in your language to explain the situation that the, if the man was put on the cross and had he not died, what would you call that? A man is taken to the gallows. A noose is put around his neck. And the rope is pulled. But before he expires, they cut the rope and he's reprieved. Ten years later, fifteen years later, the man dies of natural death. Was he hanged? I want you to tell me, not unhanged. What happened to him? In your language, you haven't got a word. In your language, you have no words to describe situations like that. You know, a verb to tell you what happened. So you, you can't say he was hanged. You can't say he was crucified. But yet, the way they do that now is to put that in inverted commas. You see, in other words, that's what people say, that he died, that he died, you see, he was crucified, in inverted commas. I have now coined a word to save Christendom the misery of not having a word, and that word is crucifixion, C-R-U-C-I, cruci, F-I-C-T-I-N, crucifixion, in other words, it's just an act taking place. The man is not actually dying, so he's not crucified in inverted commas, rather that the person was crucifixed, F-I-C-T-E-D, ficted. It's like a fiction, crucifixed. So, I don't know what what issues. Now, if I give you briefly, I said, look, there are so many reasons that we say, the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 3, it reads, and he gave, after his alleged crucifixion, he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. A-L-I-V-E, alive. He gave convic conviction, uh, convic uh, 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 proofs that he was alive. Mary Magdalene, she goes and testifies to the other, the other disciples that he is alive, and they believe not. Alive, A-L-I-V-E, alive, not resurrected. The word that is alive, is again alive. Then the other, the two from Emmaus, when they returned to that upper room where they had the Last Supper, they come and testify that they'd met Jesus and that he is alive and they believe not. Thomas is told that Jesus is alive and he believed not. Amazing situation. You read this in your own mother tongue. The word is alive, 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 not resurrected, resurrected, resurrected. So you invent the word resurrected and you thumb suck it and tell the world, that alive and resurrection are one and the same thing. It is not. Alive is alive as if the Holy Ghost didn't know the word resurrected. If that was what had happened, then the Holy Ghost must inspire Luke and Mark and Matthew and John that he is resurrected, resurrected, not once, not once. Are they made to say resurrected? They're made to say alive, 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 alive. And the man, he is in disguise, eternally in disguise. He never came out into the open. Why? If he's alive, if he has conquered death, 
there's no need to be afraid anymore because the scripture says it is ordained unto all men once to die and after that the judgment. You can't die twice. But this man, you can see the way he's behaving as if he has escaped death by the skin of his teeth. Pontius Pilate, he finds a man not guilty. His wife sees a dream in which she is told that no harm should come to this just man. He is only three hours on the cross and no man can die on the cross in three hours. According to your own church historians, people, write, write, people who write biographies of Jesus, you see, William Hanna in his life of Christ, he says that the victim of crucifixion invariably survived the first day. And sometimes he lived up to the second and third day and there are instances where people have lived up to the fourth and fifth day on the cross alive. Why should Jesus die within, within three hours? The other two that were supposed to have been hanged with him, they were alive when the, they had to break the bones. The, bo the bones of Jesus, the legs of Jesus were not broken. Why not? Because the Bible says this is fulfillment of prophecy. It can only help a person if the bones are not broken, if he's alive. If the man is dead and you break his bones, you, you saw them to pieces, you smash them up, what difference does it make? So when you look at the every inch and every individual act, I can give you 30 different reasons from the scriptures to say that Jesus Christ was neither killed nor crucified. You have this book here, Crucifixion or Crucifixion. This book is available absolutely free of charge and you read it for yourself. But I don't know this wool that the brother, the doctor has pulled over our eyes. How many, what portion of that wool can I start removing in these 10 minutes? So now I hope at Christian time we'll have better opportunity to justify the subject whether Jesus Christ was crucified or was that a fiction. وآخر الدعوان أن الحمد لله رب العالمين Mr. Douglas you say that the word of God cannot be changed and I believe that God will preserve his word so how do you explain the many deletions and changes that have been made in the Bible for example Verses from the book of Levitic Leviticus commanding the people not to eat swine flesh. Deleted. Quran can be proven to be its original form as it was revealed. What is the proof that the Bible is still whole and unchanged? Well, as Dr. Didat has said, this is a subject for a whole evening's discussion. In terms of uh, the proof that the Bible is still whole and unchanged, the, the evidence is in the great multitude of manuscripts of varying ages, many of them quite ancient, derived from a variety of different settings or countries, taking these, putting them as it were side by side, looking, seeing, comparing. Obviously there are uh, portions of the Bible where people have questions. You refer to Leviticus. I'm surprised you didn't look at the first part of John 8 or the end of Mark 16 where in various translations in English you will find those footnoted saying that these materials are not found in some ancient manuscripts. It's a case of bringing all this together and looking at what is there and and comparing one against the other in terms of of age and origin. It's out of that kind of a very upfront, very forthright sort of comparison from a human perspective. And even if you take all of those things away, in effect in terms of the teaching of the Bible, you've lost absolutely nothing. Uh, the Old Testament obviously forbids the Jew to eat pork. And so I'm not quite sure what you're referring to there. I mean, the prohibition is there. Whether the particular verse you have in mind out of Leviticus uh, is something else or not. I'm simply saying it's a case of, of dealing with the things from a, a scholarly and a historical perspective. 
beyond that there is the whole question of God. Does God preserve and protect his word? Either he does or he doesn't. Now preserve and protect his word can mean in terms of meaning, in terms of what God has said that he wants people to do, or down to counting every I and every A and every E, which is a different thing, which has nothing to do with what the Bible teaches as such. Mr. Dida, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, or any of the others so raised, were they spiritualized? Paul spoke of the resurrection at the end of time. You see, the difference between resurrection and resuscitation is obvious. If Lazarus was resurrected, in that case he would still be walking this earth. He might have been here with us. Because as the scripture tells us that no man can die twice. So where is he now? If he was resurrected, either he spiritualized and gone up to heaven, but that didn't appear to the Jews so. He walked among the people and he lived among the people and he went back home and he ate food. So it must have been a resuscitation, not a resurrection in the sense that only once you are resurrected and after that, the judgment. I hope that answers that question. To Mr. Douglas, why or what is the difference of the Old and New Testament? Shouldn't it just be one like the Quran? It is one like the Quran. The Old Testament is the Word of God given in part through Moses to the Jewish people, setting forth a multitude of ordinances and provisions for their lives, pointing on beyond to the coming of the Messiah. But to, to assume that the Old Testament and the New Testament somehow are at cross purposes or that they are different, they are different in some of the in some of the uh, legal provisions because of the nature of God's dealing with Israel of old as opposed to God's dealing with all of humankind through Jesus. But they are one in that they are both from God, that they both record the acts of God and hence the revelation of God's own nature leading to the greatest act of God's revelation in the person of Jesus and in his death and in his resurrection. Um, may I simply say, it's off the subject, and I guess maybe we're not supposed to do this with these times, but uh, you're right, Mr. Didot, death has many things, many kinds of meaning, but the Gospels say they killed Jesus. That's very clear. Um, dear Brother Ahmadida, please clear the misunderstanding for the Christians about Jesus as never being crucified nor killed on the cross, but the situation looked like Jesus was there. The doctor made it appear, you know, as he was accusing me of reading into the scripture, uh, not seeing that he's doing, he had been doing the very same thing. Worse, you see, he says from the Holy Quran that the Quran says there's no illatibazan that they are following conjecture. You see, fiction. But it says now it appeared to them so shubbiha lahum. Now shubbiha doesn't mean that somebody was substituted. The doctor says somebody was substituted. The Quran says now Quran doesn't say anything to that effect. I don't know whether the doctor knows Arabic. I'm sure he does. 
the amount of time you spend in the Middle East, and if you can show from the Quran that this word shubbihalahum means substitution, it would be something. Interpretations of people is quite a thing apart. We are talking about books. When I'm referring from the Bible, I said, look, your book says a spirit has no flesh and bones. Do you understand that English? A spirit has no flesh and bones. If I were to tell you that because I got flesh and bones, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spook. I said, is that what it means in your language, you Englishman? Is that what it means in your language? And he says, yes. If I got flesh and bones, then I'm not the other thing. I asked the same question to the Zulu in his language. I said, is this what it means in your language? And he agrees. And every language group on earth, when you say the spirit has no flesh and bones, it means what it says. Now you have to tell me that, look, in my language, when a man says a spirit has no flesh and bones, it means a spirit has flesh and bones. Sometimes we English people, we speak in opposites. See, and we mean the same thing. When we say, when we say, uh, slow down, we mean also slow up. You know, one father says, slow up, slow up, man, you know, you're too fast. The other says, look, he's telling you, why don't you slow down? Why don't you slow down? He says, slow down, slow up means the same thing. When we say in English, look out, we don't mean look out, we mean look in. So what are you talking about? What are you talking about? So a Frenchman was trying to learn English. Sitting in a skyscraper building, tall building, sitting by the window, and hears somebody shouting, look out! And he looks out, and a brick grazed him on the head. <laughs> he said, what's this? You know, what kind of language is this? He tells me to look out, and I look out. He says, no, when we say look out, means you look in, you don't look out. <laughs> doctor, doctor, sahib, I says, please tell us, tell these people that in my language, in English, when we say a spirit has no flesh and bones, that it has flesh and bones. Tell them so. Dr. Douglas, we hear from time to time that the Bible is being changed by some of your scholars, which results of having different versions. Which version do you suggest to be the best. If you think that the Bible is not changed, please refer this question to Mr. Didat. You're ready. You're ready for this. I want to be sure he's ready for this. But... All right. All right. <laughs> I will refer this to him because he, he obviously feels the Bible is changed and so uh, um, will want to speak to this. I think the Bible is, uh, is not changed. Uh, the, question, uh, the question is um, which version do you suggest to be the best? Well now you recognize when you're talking about a version you're talking about a translation into English, into German, into French, into Arabic. And I suggest that the version is best that most accurately represents what the Greek text of the New Testament says. Like I would say to you, what version of the Quran is best? Is it Sales? Is it Pickthalls? Is it Arberries? Do you know these translations? Do you know these versions? Some of you do. Which one is the best? Well, you would probably say none of those. The one, the one that has the English and the Arabic parallel one with another. And I would be glad to submit to any of you, if I could stay here two or three days, that we'd get half a dozen, we'd pick any text you want, and we would see the difference in the translations into English. And so which version of the Quran is best? The one that most faithfully reflects the Arabic, if you cannot read Arabic. Which version of the Bible is best? The one that most faithfully reflects the Greek of the Bible. And so in effect, I'd say to you, this one's best. Right here. Right here. 
Why do I say this? Because this is a compilation of the best of all the ancient manuscripts. And if there are any questions about what the text says, they're right down at the bottom. They're not burned up, hidden away, destroyed, denied, lost, or whatever else. They're right there for you to look at and to ask, what difference do these differences make? And in terms of what this text says, those differences basically make no difference. Now, Mr. D. Dot's friend on one occasion said to me, Oh, the Christians are changing the Bible. It used to say in John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And today they've taken the word begotten out. And he would point that it's there in the King James and it's not there in the Revised Standard. And that's right, it's there in the King James and it's not there in the Revised Standard. Has someone changed the Bible? No. The word was never there in the Greek text. There's only one word in the Greek text, monogenes. And so the Bible's been changed? No, the English translation has been sharpened. No alteration of the words at all. Let me correct Dr. Douglas. <laughs> the difference between version and translation. You see, the, the Christian scholars and missionaries are trying to confuse the Muslims with the term that version and translation means one and the same thing. It doesn't. You have the, in Christendom the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, the Douay or Reims version. That version has 73 books inside. 73 books. The one that the Protestant world upholds is the King James version of the Bible. This version has 66 books, seven books less. Now you see, it's not just translation. It is not a choice of words. When the Muslim says, Translation, he means translation. Yusuf Ali, Daryabadi, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, Maududi. Each and every one of these are translations. The difference is in the choice of words, synonymous words, terms. Different words are being used to translate a certain word according to the person's understanding or grasp of the language. That's a translation. But when seven books are thrown out of a book of God, those seven books, according to Brother Jimmy Swaggart, he said, he said, they are spurious, those seven books. These scholars say that they are apocrypha. I'm asking what is apocrypha? Apocrypha is a technical term for saying doubtful authority. In other words, it's not the word of God. So the Protestants say no. Then Dr. Douglas is a Protestant. He doesn't accept those seven books as the word of God. If you do, then you are a Roman Catholic. Then, he said, the most accurate, we go to the Greek scriptures, and the most accurate rendering of the scriptures is the RSV. That is what your scholars say. 32 scholars of the highest eminence in America, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they produce the RSV, Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And they say beautiful thing about the King James Version, which every Christian takes an oath by, including Jimmy Swaggart. This is the book he uses. This is the book he sells. Now, they say, the revisers, that this book, the King James Version, has grave defects. And that these defects are so many and so serious as to call for revision. So they revised it. So they threw out, leave out the word begotten. You were going to the Greek scriptures. Hmm, I don't know Greek. But the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, the bedrock of Christendom, Christianity. Because what is the dispute? We say God is one, he say God is one. But they say that God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So we are at variance. We are at variance. Now that verse in the Trinity, the only place in this Bible, I don't know whether it is in his Bible, the Greek, he didn't say which version he's holding. 
But the bulk of Christendom, this is the one they have in their hands. And the verse is in first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And it is thrown out as a fabrication, out of the RSV, by your scholars. So that's a version. It's thrown out as a fabrication, adulteration. Then the ascension of Jesus, the only places in the Gospels where it occurs is... Mark chapter 16 verse 19 that he ascended into heaven. Luke chapter 24 verse 51 that he ascended into heaven. They are also thrown out as fabrications. Now that is version. You see, this is not saying that the translation. It's not translation. Things that were supposed to be not there, they threw it out and honesty demands that you do. So that is the difference between a version and a translation. <laughs> Dr. Douglas. Do you believe the Old Testament to be the whole of the Word of God? If your answer is yes, do you say that Jesus was cursed because he was hanged to death? I'm sorry, let me repeat the question because I thought I misunderstood it. Do you believe in the Old Testament to be the whole Word of God? Yes, I believe the Old Testament to be the Word of God. I do not believe it to be the totality of the Word of God. But that, I, as I see the question, is, is not what's being asked. If your answer is yes, which it is, do you say that Jesus was cursed because he was hanged to death, as the Old Testament said? The New Testament definitely says Jesus was crucified or was hanged. And from the perspective of the Jews, yes, he was cursed. He became a curse for you and me. In effect, taking the curse of sin and the punishment for sin upon himself. It's not that the Christian comes along and says a curse on Jesus. It says that the Christian says, or I as a Christian say, I better not speak for all Christians. I as a Christian say, Jesus bore the curse of my sin. The Jews treated Jesus as one they viewed as accursed or cursed. And they killed him. Because they felt he was false, he was not what they expected, but God in fact had in mind his death and his resurrection, and out of that curse, a blessing. Mr. Dedet, if Christ showed the disciples that he hadn't died, that he did not die, why would they go forth preaching he had died and maintain this story of their own martyrdoms? If Christ showed the disciples that he hadn't died, why would they go forth preaching that he had died? I do not read into the scripture that they started preaching. You know, his immediate disciples that Christ had died. What they were telling is that he's alive, that he's alive, that he's alive. And it was an anticlimax to the idea that they had that the man was killed on the cross. That was their experience because they were not eyewitnesses or your witnesses of the happening. So now comes Jesus and he demonstrates to them that he's there. He's the very same Jesus that was before eating broiled fish and honeycomb and going and traveling with them ever in hiding so they said no the man is alive we expected him to have died he hadn't died so that was the conviction that God saved him and that is what they were preaching this idea that he died for the sins of mankind it doesn't seem to occur to me because this is against the law of God Almighty where he says the soul that sinneth it shall die this is the law of God that the one that sins that, this, that is, that soul shall die. And the son shall not be the iniquity of the father. Meaning, whatever father Adam did, and mother Eve did, he says, the son will not be the iniquity, the sin of the father. Neither shall the son be the, the, father be, the, son be the iniquity of the father. 
It says, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. This is the law of God, that whatever good thing the good man does, he gets his reward. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. Whatever evil thing the evil man does, he gets punished for it. But if the wicked will turn from all the sins that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. This is the law of God for all eternity. He does not take an innocent man to pay for the guilty. This is against his justice. Doctor was talking about the justice of God, the mercy of God. I said, what kind of mercy and justice is this? That he can't punish the evil mongers, the sinners, so he takes his own son and he gets him crucified. Love, you call that love? Killing an innocent man, his own innocent son. Amazing, amazing type of reasoning, logic. The God of the Bible, as well as the Quran, the Bible says, Jesus, uh, in the book of Isaiah, said, I forgive sins for my own sake. And I will not rem remember your sins. In other words, once he forgives you, he's not asking you for blood of sheep or goat or lamb, nor of his son, but he says, I forgive sins for my own sake, and once I've forgiven, I don't remember it. It's all blotted out. This is the law of God in the Bible and the teaching of Jesus, where Jesus Christ, he says, he says, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. In other words, the way I carry my responsibility, you carry yours. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus says, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you. Jesus says to his disciples, unless you are better than the Jew. And I'm asking, how can you be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? Mr. Douglas, this one's for you. Christians claim that Jesus, peace be upon him, is God. My question is, did Jesus claim himself as the God? Did he say, I am God? Or did he ask his followers to worship me? One quick word to what uh, Dr. Didat was saying a moment ago about the disciples going forth and preaching uh, Jesus' death. According to the record in the holy book, they did. Uh, ten days after he ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit came. They said, men of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, so on and so forth. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose. You, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross, but God raised him from the dead. The very next time that they were up to speak, you handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. So very quickly they were in fact preaching that. They were right or they wrong. They were deceived or, or uh, something very strange had, had, gone on, had gone on. Did Jesus claim to be God? You mean in his very own words. If you're looking for the expression, I say that I am God, just those words, you do not find it. But at the time of Jesus' trial, when he stood before the Jewish authorities, they said to him, tell us, are you the son of the blessed one? Now, who is the blessed one? Mary? or God. And Jesus said, I am. And they said, what further need do we have for proof? He has blasphemed. Let him die. Blasphemy is taking to a human being that which uniquely belongs to God. And nobody knew that any better than the Jews. No people in those days were any more sensitive to that. And so, yes, Jesus claimed to be God. Three times in the Gospel of John, he makes the statement, except you believe I am, you will die in your sins. Before Abraham was born, I am. They took up stones to stone him, for they understood full well what he was saying. 
Why did they react that way to that language? Because of the Old Testament in which God says, My name is I am. I am that I am. And so, yes, Jesus claimed to be God. Uh, did he ask his followers to worship him? If you mean, did he say to his followers, Followers, fall down and worship me? No, you do not find those words coming from the lips of Jesus in the Gospels. But you do find people falling down and worshiping him. And he accepted it. He did not say, get up. He did not say, you're mistaken. He did not say, leave. He did not say, that is inappropriate. He did not say, you're wrong. He accepted it. Ahmed did that. You base your arguments on small points of the Bible, the same Bible which you believe is inaccurate. To me, this is a contradiction. Why do you do this? I do respect your religion, but this is a problem I can't understand. Mr. Chairman and brethren, you see, in every civilized nation on earth, people have disputes. And when these disputes go to court, the plaintiff, the complainant, he goes into the box, into the witness box, and he testifies. He puts forth his claim. And the opposing advocate, attorney, he cross-examines the witness. When he's cross-examining the witness on the evidence that he has given, and on that evidence, if you can prove to the judge's satisfaction that the man is lying, lying, lying. If he feels satisfied that he has convinced the judge in his cross-examination that the witness was a liar. What he does is he closes the case and he asks for absolution with costs and he will get it. And this is normal practice in everyday affair. Dispute. You cross-examine the person and you come to a conclusion. Now the Holy Quran tells us to do the same. It says, Waqalu, and they say, who the Jews and the Christians, say, that you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. There's no heaven for you. There's no salvation for you, except you become a Jew or except you become a Christian. In answer to that, God Almighty makes us to say, Tilka amani yuhum, that this is their wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. Pull, tell them, how to burhanakum. So produce, produce your evidence. In kuntum sadiqeen, if you are speaking the truth, let's have a look at your certificate that entitles it to heaven and destines us to hell. So they have produced it, the Bible, in 2,000 different languages. And he's saying, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. So we have to cross-examine the Bible, your witnesses. And we are proving from the mouth of your witnesses that the thing that you are alleging, what you are saying, you are claiming, is not there. You see? Now you say, what about the other things which are true? I say, look, that is not at stake. If the Bible says that God is one, we say, we agree with you. He said, I quoted you from the Bible. He said, look, everyone is personally responsible for his or her action. I say, we agree with you. Can't you see? If you say... God is a loving father in heaven. I said, right, we agree with you. But when you say that he's like Shylock, wanting to get a pound of flesh from his creation, Adam and Eve sins and he makes you responsible. And at the beginning of 1986, there were 4.8 billion people on earth. And according to the Christian belief that everyone goes to hell for what? The sin that Adam and Eve committed. So I said, this is the most nonsensical idea. Because Adam didn't ask me before eating the apple, nor did Eve ask my wife. How can God hold us responsible? <laughs> Mr. Douglas, Matthew, the 12th chapter, and the 40th verse says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be uh, in three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I am a Christian of the Church of Christ. I am confused. Please explain to me how Jesus could be in the earth three days and three nights.
Well, first of all, let me say I'll be delighted to talk with you about this at a more, in a more extended way than, than uh, our time now permits. The thing that I think you must realize is the thing that I tried to say earlier when I alluded to this passage. If one is going to take three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and uh, insist upon absolute literalism, are we talking about uh, 72 hours? Now, what are we talking about? Three days and three nights. Or are we talking about an approximation of time, as I mentioned? When I report to people that I see along the way, they'll say, where have you been? I said, in Lawrence, Kansas. How long you were there? How long were you there? I was there two days. Well, I have not been in Lawrence and will not be in Lawrence 48 hours. The writers of the New Testament were writing for a variety of different audiences who counted time differently. And if you will look at the computation of time with reference to the death of Jesus in John's Gospel, with in comparison to the computation of time with reference to the death of Jesus in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you'll find a difference. A difference simply in the way they described time. For, as Mr. Didot has said, the Jews, the day begins at sundown and moves on. The Romans did not think that way. And so you find some writers dealing in Roman time. You find other writers dealing in more of what you would think of as Semitic or Hebraic time. And the difference there is a very understandable thing. It's a question of reporting. If any of you who are Americans have been in the military and I said to you, now, what time is it? You would report it's 2200. And others of you would think, what in the world is he saying? Why, it's 10 o'clock, the same time different descriptions. This would be Mr. Didat's last question. Mr. Didat, in the book of Re Revelation, Jesus claims that I am the first and the last. And also he said, I am Alpha and Omega, and the beginning and the end. If Christ was not God, how could he make such a claim? The book of Revelation, scholars will tell you, was a dream of John. It was a dream which he has put down on paper. These are what people hear, if at all, that if Jesus appeared to him, to John, and told him, I am Alpha and Omega, if he did, which I do, do not believe. There's talking about God Almighty, that God is saying, I am Alpha and Omega. I am the first and the last, not Jesus. But suppose you put these words into the mouth of Jesus, according to your translations. Even then, a dream. You know, a people, when they eat a bit too much, it happens you dream dreams, things that you see. And you read this book of Revelation, describing to you certain beasts with eyes outside and eyes inside and you know something which absolutely you have eaten too much you start thinking in those terms so I said now while Jesus walked this earth we have to now understand that while he walked this earth in none of the Gospels Matthew Mark Luke or John is the expression ever used I am God or worship me on the contrary he says my father is greater than I he says my father is greater than all he says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I seek not my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He says, of that day knoweth no man, no, not the angels, nor the son, but the Father in heaven. In my knowledge, I'm not like God. In my power, I'm not like God. He says, all power is given unto me. It is not mine. I by the finger of God cast out devils. I by the spirit of God do these things. Where does he say that he is doing the works? That it is his power, he is doing it. Nowhere. And Peter testified in the quotation that uh, the doctor gave. Peter in the book of Acts testifies. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. A man, not God, approved 
among you. A man. He quoted it, but of course the quotation went off such like water and ducks back. You people hardly apprehended anything. It says, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him. He didn't do it. Which God did by him in the midst of you, which you also know. I said, look, we agree with that. The Quran testifies to that effect that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. He healed those blind and the lepers by God's permission. We agree with that. But I said, look now, your interpretation, your reading, you are reading into your own scripture something that is not there and which is contrary to what Jesus claimed. He's teaching us, he's come, I'll teach you how to pray. It's a prayer like this. So, oh, our Father which art in heaven, our Father, yours and mine, including Judas, not the Father of Jesus Christ in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, singular, thy name, thy will be done, thy... As, as, in, as it is on earth, as it is in heaven, where does he say I'm God? Where does he say worship me? Nowhere. Nowhere. It is something now, like I just heard on TV, the program of Brother Jimmy Swaggart. Uh, he's giving some lessons on TV. And at the end of that lesson on Babylon, one of his panel members, he says, you know, I've been to Mongolia. I've just been to Mongolia. And there, he said, I went to a Buddhist temple. And there, the supervisor, while he was with me, I'm asking him that this wheel, prayer wheel, on which you people are pinning in your prayers, in written form, and you turn the wheel, what for? He says, no, this is now, we are asking in this form, asking Buddha for help. But he said, look, I read so many books on Buddha, nowhere does Buddha claim to be God. Nowhere. This is one of our panel members of Jimmy Swaggart says, no one says that, Jesus, that Buddha is God. He says, nowhere. He says, yes, that is true, but we say he is God. We make him God. This is the same. What he is talking, laughing at the Buddhists, I said, my brother, you are in the same boat. You are doing the very same thing. Brothers and sisters, I want you to acknowledge really these two fine champions, two wonderful gentlemen for sharing their valuable time and their energies with us tonight. However you want to acknowledge them. Thank you very much.